Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from LunchtimeMovieReview.com. And we are the children of the 80s. Welcome back to Lunchtime Movie Review. I'm Matt. I'm Bo. Greg. And Patrick. And and why Bo? Because Greg and I are back. It's like Bo and Luke. We got rid of the cousins. We finally signed our new contract. (laughs) We're back on the show. (laughs) It it seems like it's been forever since we've seen you. never left. You should have run that by me. I would have said Luke. I know. I I thought we were closer than we were. Yeah, thanks for coming back, guys. Where have you been? Yeah. Coy and Vance don't like dramas. (laughs) You've never left, and I try to reference one of you or both of you in every podcast we've done without you. Uh, well, it's good to have you guys back. Sure. And we're bringing, we're here to review another movie from our childhood this time, a, uh, well, the Artard movie to end all Artard movies. Rain For, Man. Force Go? <laughs> Rain Man. The one that started it all off for Oscar season. But first, our sponsor. We at Rawlbrooks care about your reputation of your family and its genetic purity. Send us your retards, idiots, morons, and mongoids. We will never let them out or share who gave them to us. Rawlbrooks, protecting your genetic purity. Now accepting blacks and Jews. (laughs) I think we could just stop after that. It's all downhill. Well, we had to get the comedy out early because <laughs> there's nothing funny about this film. <clears throat> Although they... Not Walbrook, purposely. Wal, Walbrook will also be trustees, apparently. That's nice of them. We'll take your money. Yeah. All right. Greg, give us uh, Rain Man. Rain Man is from 1988, and this is a story about Charlie Babbitt. Charlie Babbitt is played by Tom Cruise, and immediately preceding Rain Man, Cruise had played... Brian Flanagan in Cocktail, Vincent Loria in The Color of Money, and Maverick in Top Gun. In the words of Archie Bunker, he played a Mick, a Wop, and a regular American. (laughs) But aside from showing virtuosity with ethnically diverse characters such as these, in 1988, Cruz was the quintessential Hollywood matinee idol. He was also a victim of typecasting. It seemed that Hollywood wanted Tom Cruise to reprise his role in risky business interminably. The young, handsome, cocky, self-centered hustler who must desperately raise a lot of money after taking an unauthorized trip in his father's classic automobile. For his role in Rain Man, Cruise was offered a chance to show off his range, to play a character that was a departure, to shed Hollywood's typecasting straitjacket. So Cruz played the role of Charlie Babbitt as a young, handsome, cocky, self-centered hustler who must desperately raise a lot of money after taking an unauthorized trip in his father's classic automobile. (laughs) Now, a a little more about Charlie Babbitt's backstory that that gets revealed through this film. Charlie's mother died when he was two. His father, Sanford, never remarried, and he was very distant with his son. One night when Charlie was 16, he drove his father's beloved 1949 Buick Roadmaster convertible without daddy's permission. Charlie Babbitt claimed that he earned the clandestine joyride by getting straight A's. Almost straight A's. Almost straight A's. Oh, almost straight A's. That's that's right. Which means all C's. (laughs) His father. He's a rich kid. (laughs) And was that 49 Buick Roadmaster, was that the Fireball 8 with the first year of continuous Dynaflow transmission? You're the car guy. I think that's right. Yeah. His father? Definitely. (laughs) His father in the Cincinnati Police Department called it theft. So Charlie sat in jail for two days, evidently long enough for him to learn how to kite checks and run Ponzi schemes. Now an embittered and hardened criminal, Charlie Babbitt decided to cut off all ties with his father and move out west. So when Rain Man begins, Charlie is a Los Angeles car dealer. He is trying to import four gray market Lamborghinis which Charlie has promised to sell to four rich Americans and taking $80,000 of their cash and down payments. 
But standing in Charlie's way is a classic example of how overregulation by the federal government screws the honest, hardworking entrepreneur every time. Thanks to that pinko tree hugging liberal President Ronald Reagan and his Environmental Protection Agency, Charlie Babbitt cannot deliver his Lamborghinis to his customers as promised, and he faces financial ruin. Unfazed, Charlie Babbitt decides to drive his Italian whore to Palm Springs. <laughs> Because there just isn't any good shopping in Los Angeles. While en route, Charlie receives word that his father, Lon Estranged, has died. Charlie must now skip Palm Springs and take his Italian whore to Cincinnati, which is like Palm Springs, except with crappy weather and more black people. While sitting in the office of his father's attorney, Charlie Babbitt discovers the contents of his father's last will and testament. From the estate, Charlie inherits some rose bushes and the very same Buick that he stole a decade earlier. An undisclosed beneficiary receives the paltry sum of $3 million in cash. Charlie is pissed. He learns that the fortune is being funneled to one particular patient at a loony bin located on the other side of the Ohio River. We don't call it that anymore. I know. <laughs> we call it a booby hatch. <laughs> Artard house. <laughs> The patient is named Raymond, played by Dustin Hoffman. Raymond is afflicted with autism, the real kind, not a make-believe diagnosis to give dis disability benefits to kids who just won't behave. Charlie Babbitt then discovers that Raymond is his older brother, a person heretofore Charlie didn't even know existed. Why didn't anybody tell me I had a brother? Becomes Charlie's refrain, which makes a perfect counterpoint to Raymond's incessant recital of Abbott and Costello's Who is on First Routine. Raymond's trustee is Dr. Bruner, the director of the Walbrook Institution and Country Club for Retards. Dr. Bruner has cared for Raymond for more than 20 years, and he is now in charge of the $3 million from Sanford Babbitt's estate. According to Dr. Bruner, Raymond Babbitt is an autistic savant. While he is afflicted with a severe neurologic and developmental disorder, he also has a photographic memory and extraordinary skill in math. Raymond doesn't do well with change. He is a slave to routine and habits, and his life revolves around books he doesn't understand, TV shows like The People's Court and Wheel of Fortune, and tapioca pudding. After spending just a few minutes with his newfound brother, Charlie moves into action. He kidnaps Raymond and decides to use him as a bargaining chip to wrestle half of the $3 million from Dr. Bruner. He quietly drives his autistic brother and his Italian whore and his inherited convertible to a an historical hotel in uptown Cincinnati. There, Charlie continues to plot his scheme. After banning Charlie in front of his autistic brother, the Italian whore figures out that Charlie plans to use Raymond as a hostage to extort Dr. Bruner to pay a $1.5 million ransom. She is shocked that her boyfriend, who makes a living by flipping heavily leveraged luxury cars to rich bastards while thwarting U.S. customs laws, would be such a greedy, shallow, and sensitive boor. So the Italian whore walks out on Charlie decides to become a carny, and ends up on a trapeze with a bow-tie-wearing pervert. Due to Raymond's fear of flying, Charlie is forced to drive his hostage across country in the Buick. Charlie's scheme is to get the two to Los Angeles and then hire Leland McKenzie to use his lawyerly skills and a David E. Kelly script to wrestle $1.5 million for Dr. Bruner. Little L.A. Law <laughs> reference right there. During their road trip, Charlie begins a character transformation. The self-centered, greedy, white-collar criminal repeatedly caters to his brother's whims and does everything he can to make Raymond feel at home on the road. Charlie also learns the reason his father sent Raymond to, what did we call it? Not the loony bin, the... <laughs> booby hatch? The booby hatch. <laughs> Evidently, it is a bad I idea. Think it's called... I said booty hatch. Booty hatch. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, it is a bad idea to entrust a retard with a baby and scalding bathwater. Who knew? Raymond sings Charlie a Beatles song, which further triggers Charlie's childhood memories. Raymond is the shadowy protective figure from Charlie's childhood, whom Charlie falsely recalled was just an imaginary friend called the Rain Man. Rain Man, hence Raymond. Charlie sincerely believes, albeit falsely, that he can cure Raymond, that all Raymond needs is brotherly love, exposure to the outside world, and a night with a Las Vegas hooker. Charlie, the lone wolf who cut off all ties with his family a decade before, is now discovering that he needs family in his life, even if it means having a brother who is entirely dependent upon him. Charlie is convinced a life with him in Los Angeles is better for Raymond than a life in an institution. He expresses his love for his brother and this new nurturing Charlie Babbitt by deciding to exploit him. 
Charlie takes him to Las Vegas and makes a fortune at a Caesar's Palace blackjack table due to Raymond's unshakable talent for counting cards. Now that Charlie has plenty of money to cover his business losses and avoid financial ruin, he decides he no longer wants his father's money. And now that Charlie is flush with cash, his Italian whore has returned, leaving the bowtie-wearing pervert to perform for children's television. But Charlie, having completed his transformation, now decides that he wants to gain custody of his brother, even without the inheritance, because having a man capable of fleecing Caesar's palace might come in handy. But a hearing with a court-appointed psychiatrist does not go well for Charlie's quest. Barry Levinson leaves his director's chair, jumps in front of the camera, and proceeds to badger, confuse, and humiliate the retard to such an extent that Charlie gives in. As Raymond boards an Amtrak train that will return him to the Walbrook Institution and Country Club for Retards, Charlie promises to visit his brother in two weeks, or as Raymond sees it, 1,209,600 seconds. That's Raymond. That was definitely, definitely Raymond. <laughs> that was definitely, definitely more entertaining than the film even, which I liked. So when did, uh, when did Rain Man come out? Rain Man was released on December 16th, 1988. It was released on the same day as other Academy Award fodder, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, and I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. <laughs> That's some stiff competition. Another, uh, also Steve Martin playing an artard. Oklahoma, Oklahoma. <laughs> Same month as Twins, Mississippi Burning, My Stepmother is an Alien, Naked Gun, Tequila Sunrise, and Working Girl. It grossed over $172 million. It was the number one film of 1988. It outgrossed Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Coming to America, Big, Twins, and Die Hard. Uh, so there was some really big competition that year. Um, it was the highest grossing Best Picture winner of the 1980s. And the sec- at that point in time, the second highest grossing best p- picture winner in history. What was the first? Gone with the Wind. Overrated. I know. It insists upon itself. It insists right? upon <laughs> itself. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Oscar winner. What else was up that year? Uh, for office, best, best, best Picture? Yeah, for Best Picture. Best Picture, Accidental Tourists, Dangerous Liaisons, uh, Mississippi, Mississippi Burning, and Working Girl. So I think they got it right. Yeah, Mississippi Burning was good, but uh, yeah, it's probably the best one. One of the few times I think the Academy got not only popular with the fans, but popular with the Academy. Yeah, it's a uh, box office success and a critical success. All right, so this is an Oscar winner, but what else is going on in 1988? Well, as Patrick said, this came out December 16th, 1988, and put this into your timeline as young kids, uh, you'll remember that on December 21st, 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 was blown out of the sky by some crazy Arabs. Hmm. Hmm. Well, we never saw them again. No, no. They, no, never, they just kind of s- disappeared right back into yeah. uh, the Middle East. And never caused any other problems in the future. No. Nope. Also in December 1988, if you're a big skateboarding fan, Lance Mountain was on the cover of Thrasher Magazine. That's big. Who? <laughs> Lance Mountain? Yeah. Obviously, you didn't skate. Was Lance Mountain. The Lance Mountain? The Lance Mountain. <laughs> yeah, it's not Tony Hawk. I got nothing. And also... Uh, Crew Su- Jones. Super Mario Brothers 3 was a best-selling video game. Right, because the wizard had just come out. It what? It did debut in The Wizard, which I'm surprised did not get an Oscar nod. <laughs> well, <That's> special effects. <laughs> yeah. That year, there are some uh, honorable mentions for Mega Man 2 and Contra. Ooh, we're also Contra. out. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, select, stop. That, that's why I threw you that one. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, this is really a two-person film. I mean, there's a lot of people listed in it. The Italian whore from <laughs> Frida and Frida. She was in Frida. Was she in Frida? I don't think she was in Frida, dude. Yeah. She was in Big Top Pee Wee. We yeah, did. She was in Frida, that. dude. It's like Big Top Pee Wee and Hot Shots. Yeah, that's a. Yeah, she was in Frida. Look it up. But yeah, Hot Shots, Big Top Pee Wee. Like, are you saying like she was like an extra in it, or are you saying that she played Look, Frito, Frida? No, she wasn't Frida because that was that other bitch you can't stand. Right. Penelope, Penelope Cruz, Cruz. I, I hate Penelope Cruz. Conchita no. Alonzo, but, but that yes. was not Frida. Selma Hayek. Selma Hayek. Frida. Yeah, Selma Hayek. Whatever, dude. They're same, all the same. Same thing. Penelope Cruz, Selma Hayek. Hayek? Hayek. 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 Whatever. H-A-Y-E-K. They're, they're, I think they're the same chick. Yeah, and sure. it, when you get a unibrow, it all just starts. Yeah. No, she was in Frida. Blimey. I just saw her. It was on IMDb. She was on it. But, uh, but yeah, that's what she's known from. Big Top Pee Wee and... Hot, Hot shots. shots. Yes. Yeah. Was, she's not known for big top. That's pretty much it. But then no. she's she went back to Italy and she's doing nothing but basically Italian. Well, yeah, because so. she can't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> but this is really just a two person 
a two person or a two character film uh, driven by Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise. And Greg already pointed out Tom Cruise is a juggernaut at this point. Seems like it. Yeah, he's yeah. he's a he's certainly an A list leading man movie star that uh, is probably getting you know the the. But the I mean, pick it, of the litter as far as roles are concerned. If but, you can make if you can make bartending look cool, yeah, then you can make artards look cool. Without a doubt, he's had three box office hits in a row, um, with Top Gun, uh, Color of Money, and then Cocktail. Cocktail coming out the same year as this one, and then this one came out, and for all intents and purposes, heavy drama, not expected to be a huge hit, even though he's in it. But they're hoping people will come to it and actually ends up being the number one film of the year. Beats out Cocktail. And then what? what's he do after this? What's his next film? Born on the 4th of July. Oh. Huh. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Oh. Jeez. <laughs> Talk about insisting upon it. Yeah. <laughs> and he wins for that. Wins what? The Oscar. No. no. He's, He's just won. nominated? He's just nominated. Oh, good. So they got that one right. <laughs> Yeah, because he grew his hair out and he wheeled around oh, he's in a wheelchair, wheelchair yelling penis. Yeah, right. <laughs> they gave it to Daniel Day Lewis for my left foot. Oh, oh yeah, R-tard. yeah. You're going to talk about retards. That <laughs> yeah. guy can just that guy can bring it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what's his name? Tom Cruise. No. Daniel Day Lewis. No. Dustin Hoffman. You're not even Maria close. Alonzo Conchita. <laughs> <laughs> Carol Robert Conner. Robert Downey Jr. had it right. In uh, and another Tropic Tom, Thunder, yeah. Tom Cruise movie, and, an, and another Tom yeah. Cruise movie, yeah. Anyway, what about uh, Dustin Hoffman? He's, I mean, he's Dustin Hoffman, the Dustin Hoffman. He's done a lot up to this point, but yeah, he'd won an Oscar before for Best Actor for Kramer versus Kramer, and, and had been nominated a bunch of times. And did he? Now, did he win for Tootsie? No, he no, was he, nominated. he was nominated. He won for Kramer. Versus wait, 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 was he nominated for Best Actor or Actress? Best Actor. Oh, yeah. But he really didn't do much during the 80s that I was surprised looking back at. He did Kramer versus Kramer in 79, which he won. He did Tootsie, I believe, 81 or 82. And then he disappears, does Ishtar in 86, which everyone remembers right. as a terrible, terrible film. But he doesn't do anything in the as far as film. He does a television series of Death of a Salesman or a television movie of Death of a Salesman. And yeah, then he does he, this. And he then played, he disappears again. Which he played on Broadway. So he was doing some oh, theater right. at this time. Oh, he, I mean, no, and he does do theater. Mm-hmm. He, he's known to be to do theater. For yeah, him. he was a well-known theater actor, but it's it's weird that he didn't take the, the Oscar for Kramer versus right. Kramer and parlay, make, that. parlay that into more, you know, he was, an, he was an Academy favorite. They loved him in films. But you think like the late 80s, when I think the late 80s, what instantly comes to mind are short, ugly Jewish men. I don't understand why he didn't get more work. So we call him this, this is his most well-known role? No. Other than The Graduate, maybe? Graduate, Tootsie. I would say Tootsie. You think even Tootsie? See, I think Tootsie's almost, this almost overshadows Tootsie. I definitely think before that, but I, I th- Tootsie's pretty forgettable now. I mean, it does. it's not one that keeps well, coming back. This I would consider a classic. As much as I like Rain Man, I don't think Rain Man is, you know, on everyone's, a lot of people's top 20 list for all-time films. No, but I think it's a big pop culture. Well, the, yeah, he's yeah. definitely a, a band. <laughs> yeah, know. I agree. Well, now let's talk about this, uh, the story then. Just uh, Rain Man, an, an ode to... Institutions? Art hearts. Oh. We all did some research on this. I thought it was interesting that a couple things about just the, this is they're making the film is that Dustin Hoffman was always attached to it, but not always as Raymond. No, he was originally attached to play the Tom Cruise part. Um, and then after having some interaction with an autistic person, decided he wanted to play that role. Was the autistic guy going to be his younger brother or was it going to be the older brother? I, Were they going to bring out one of the guys from Cocoon to play his yeah. older brother? <laughs> I have no idea who they were going to get to, to play it if he played the Charlie Babbitt role, but the there was other actors that had been considered. Jack Nicholson was considered. At one point, they were trying to get Dennis and Randy Quaid to play it, and I just don't think that would be believable because who believes <laughs> Randy Quaid would have any mental health issues? Right, yeah. And then Jack Nicholson, that's a real stretch. Wow, we haven't seen him institutionalized before. Right. What about Mickey Rooney? <laughs> But <laughs> yeah, they said De Niro, too, was also yeah. considered yeah. for Rain. I would but, love to see, like, uh, Dustin Hoppin play the Tom Cruise character and, like, Burgess Meredith going, definitely, definitely, <laughs> I drive. God damn it. Yeah, what, what, what was also interesting is that originally it was not supposed to be an autistic savant. It was supposed to be someone who was mentally retarded. That full was retard. Full retard. And because that, it's based on someone who, 
who was mentally retarded. That's true, but n- not at the time. At the time, they really thought that the guy who uh, they modeled Rain Man after was autistic, and then they realized, no, he's really mentally retarded. Well, Which is funny because get- in the film they talk about that they used to categorize people with autism as mentally retarded, and that's just inaccurate. But here it was accurate. Not yeah. the film, the real life person. Correct. Yeah, we should flesh that out a little bit more. But I did. I wanted to come back to Randy and Dennis McQu- <laughs> <laughs> Quaid. I just think that's hilarious that Hollywood's like, we want brothers. One of them that's kind of normal, and one of them that's just a retard. What are the bridges doing? <laughs> Are Hollywood executives just a high 24-7, just <laughs> face drunk that they're like, ah, they, they missed an opportunity. They, had, they should have gotten with brothers. Right. Frank and Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> yeah. Or the, the Baldwins weren't available? Yeah, pre-Baldwin. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen Baldwin wasn't around. It wouldn't work right. with the retarded person was the younger brother. <laughs> and then I did read that uh, Dustin Hoffman wanted Bill Murray as, to play Charlie. I thought it was... I don't, I don't oh, know. All right. Yeah, sure. He's a little younger, but not not a lot. Yeah, it would probably would have played better as far as the the age gap is so big between the it's two. Huge. Right? So right. It's huge. So right, twenty four years. Yeah, Tom should have been calling Dustin father. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, twenty four year difference right. between the two. <clears throat> I could see Bill Murray playing that uh, that character though. Been, I'm supportive of anything Bill Murray wants to do. I'll watch it. Pretty Except much. for Stripes, you hate Stripes. I didn't hate Stripes. Go back and listen. I hated the second half of Stripes, otherwise known as Not Stripes, the one where we go do a mission. <laughs> but yeah, the it was originally full retard. He was originally to be mentally retarded, and Dustin Hoffman specifically said, well, I want to play it as autistic because of this guy that he had interactions with, right? Kim Peek? Yeah, Kim Peek. And you, Jason and Greg kind of looked into some of the things about that, and, and we already referenced that they... That he was believed to be autistic, but then he was categorized. Uh, he, yeah, he, he had a changed form, his, his yeah, diagnosis. He had a form of mental retardation, a syndrome that he was born with um, that wasn't the result of, uh, you know, it, it, a little bit different than a developmental disorder like autism. And But he also had some of those. Uh, he had the photographic memory. He had the ability to do computations in his head, very complicated things, although not really understanding what he was doing, the concepts. But... And didn't so, you say it was a chromosomal issue that kind of triggered that? Yeah, that that's it's a birth defect that a very small number of the population can suffer from. Um, it's congenital. It caused some deformities and and an enlarged head and and the brain activity that I guess the same brain activity that that results in the mental retardation also can result in these sort of savant like uh, qualities. So yeah, kind of like how. Uh John Travolta played that retard in uh, Phenomena. He had the boop same boop thing. Doo doo doo. <laughs> the thing that I remember most about this and the film. screen, the screenwriter of of Rain Man based the character on the same person, and then Dustin Hoffman with the screenwriter interacted with him, and so Dustin Hoffman took a lot of the the idiosyncrasies, the the habits, the the walk, the physicality, and applied that to his role. And Dustin Hoffman, I believe, hit him in the head repeatedly to see how he would react, and then he would be able to do it accurately on screen. Well, I like how I read originally it w- he was supposed to be very friendly and, and kind of outgoing as a retard, so it's like they they made him Down syndrome, like he was just going to oh, go around giving people everyone hugs. Everyone hugs, yeah, yeah, and their trip to the zoo instead right. of to Los Angeles. Waving at everyone yeah. and giving hugs, and he played it down and went withdrawn and autistic and don't like to be touched, which is accurate to people with Pretty severe autism, low functioning autism. No, oh, even Asperger's, I guess. Apparently, is a. But it's 2012, my friend. Don't we all have autism at this point? <laughs> Asperger's, it's to some degree or another. But the movie's pretty accurate, right? I mean, here you have Dustin Hoffman playing Rain Man, and he watches Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune, The People's Court. And I always wondered as a kid, why the hell do these shows remain on the air? Because they're horrible. Right. But now you know. Autistic people and old people. Retards. Because my grandma at 90 years old loved freaking People's Court and Jeopardy and... And Wheel of Fortune. And MacGyver. That was the other one. Everyone loved MacGyver. But Rain Man didn't watch MacGyver. <laughs> but Greg, you found something in like Variety, a criticism of, of oh, Dustin no, Hoffman? Oh, no, it was a Washington Post. Crit- well, there were a lot of... Yeah, uh, you know, New York Times, Variety, Washington Post critics that did not like this film. 
And they were the, the, the minority. I mean, they were on the outside looking in. But in, a Washington Post critic in particular said, you know, the problem with Dustin Hoffman is he's just not. He's just too withdrawn. I and mean, he's too too realistic. I mean, we want, I just, you know, he needs to look at the camera and wink or something. <laughs> Smile. Yeah, they go clearly not getting it. Right. Not getting the whole point of. And and I and I am taking. I think he's his. Uh, I mean, I think his performance was great. He does play a autist, an autistic or someone with autism pretty well. Um, I like the you know where they. And you wouldn't necessarily know this. Maybe we know this now in 2012, but uh, back in '88, you wouldn't know some of the idiosyncrasies like the touch that they they not just that they can't be touched, but feelings and clothes and how they rub. Uh, they're real sensitive to that. So, like, you know, the the various clothes, the boxer shorts, and then my one of my favorite lines or s- scenes is is when he's putting the uh, lotion on him, the suntan lotion on him, and he's saying how it's he almost acting like it hurts. And then he asks him how it feels. He says it's slippery. You always notice textures in that. You know, the kissing is wet. You know, the really little things like that that is, you know back in '88 we didn't understand, but now kind of looking back, you realize they, he really nailed it. I agree, and and to say that well, we need more eye contact, that sort of thing. That, that's it, it's the character that he's playing who who is unable to do that. But you still see like the focus that he has on the toothpicks with uh, Bonnie Hunt, you know, and the counting the cards in Las Vegas, and and when he's looking at the phone book and and it's a photographic memory, it's now entrenched in his memory. I mean, you see. You see the workings of an actor, of, of someone who has become that character, uh, who has transformed. And, and for any critic to say, oh, it's just a bunch of artifice, it's just someone cocking his head and with a walk and this and that, that that's ridiculous. That's And I also think it's ridiculous about the eye contact thing. Because, I mean, growing up, I was taught, and I'm sure all you guys were, is not to make eye contact with the artards. Because they'll it, go crazy and beat because you Because when you do, they just yeah, don't over, stare. They, they right. sit next to you on the bus and stuff like that. They've got superhuman. It's strength. impolite to stare, that sort of thing, right? No, not stare. No, no eye contact. <laughs> eye contact means you want to communicate with them, and just things don't work out well that way. You could stare as much as you want, just don't look them in the eye. That's true. You see, eye contact invites conversation. The other thing I remember about well, this film in particular is that autism wasn't talked about before this. Really, I mean, it wasn't really known as. But I assumed that if you were autistic, you necessarily were also a savant. That it was a they were connected diagnosis. You had to be wicked smart at something if you were uh, if you were autistic. So, <laughs> and from Boston, <laughs> right. yeah. Mo- a lot, well, I just assume people from Boston are retards. So, yeah, so I would I, I would imagine that that was a, a fairly common misconception because this this was the the first real popular culture, uh, you know, telling of of autism. And if I, I'm sure there were some parents that if they were you know, got that, you know, really sad diagnosis with their child as autistic. Well, well, that's great. Well, okay. Well, Take him to Vegas. Do the right. math. He's a superhuman. Yeah, here's a piano. Do you know, do, do a Beethoven concerto right. after well, we hearing used, it once. We used know. to go and everybody that, that we heard. What's wrong autism, with you? Autism, we'd talk baseball too. So, so tell me about, tell me about the 60 Mets. And usually they didn't. Yeah. I love Matt's growing up where he just had groups of <laughs> autistic children he would run into. Just randomly. We'd ask, is he autistic? Yeah. So then you go and we know what school Matt went to now. <laughs> we had immersion at my school. I'm sorry. I didn't go to the school that excluded the uh, the artards. We had immersion. So we were forced to interact. Yeah, kind, kind of the same theme about this where Charlie Babbitt, the Tom Cruise character, is is convinced he's in there. Raymond, I know you're in there. Just snap out of it. Yeah, and, and and I can cure you. And, of course, we know that it can't be cured. And and I think at the very end, I, I think Charlie has discovered that. He's, accepted he's, it. He's accepted it. That, and, and that's why the institution is probably the best place for him because. My, my favorite Tom Cruise line is the one where he says, you know what I think, Ray? I think this autism is a bunch of shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot of people that believe it. Right, right, right. right. And, but something you just and little up. did we know that Tom Cruise actually believes this. That's true. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't believe in autism. Yeah. His character made made the right conclusion, but You're he didn't. Right. You're, he was going to take all that money here and at the casino, go to Los Angeles, pay the Church of Scientology, and he would be cured. He would reach that level. That, now, now I have a more deep found respect for Tom Cruise's uh, characterization because he was really playing something that he didn't believe in. 
Yeah, you're also you're also <laughs> glit. Yeah, you're also. My glit. character believes that that he can't be cured, but I know different. Right. Well, it's interesting that you just brought up like I went to school and we had immersion there. That in this particular the film, it almost it advocates they need to be you got to keep them separated. separated. Yeah. You know, you got you got to lock them up for the safety of your family. Um, don't talk about them. And even at the end of the film, he goes back to Walbrook. Now, arguably, probably the best for him considering his other option of living with his brother i don't think that's a viable option but it doesn't look like they even he, charlie even looks into anything else it's just like no nah, okay i'll send him back. well it's the fact that he's already institutionalized that he's been there for you know 20 25 years right. or whatever um that's i think why the decision is but I, but that i think that's an interesting point is that it is a commentary at least hollywood who you think would would at this point you know the liberal uh oh i think they're used to other people cleaning up their messes oh i see but the idea that oh this they need to be immersed and this is they can be just like everyone else and just a little bit of uh, you know monitoring or whatever but they don't they say nah institutionalize send them no. back. It was interesting. One of the facts I had read was that how a couple of people involved in the production wanted the film to end with Raymond staying with Charlie and it was Dustin Hoffman who advocated no he needs to go back to Walbrook and ultimately won that argument and I think it's a better ending to the film because it brings a complete arc for Charlie you know that right. he, he he want he kidnaps his brother because he wants the money but in the end he does what's best for his brother and allows him to go back rather than keep him with well, him. well it also demonstrates that the Charlie character no no matter his his ultimate love for his brother at the end of the movie cannot care for him the way his brother should be cared for cared for well and it also shows that uh, I kind of completes the idea that he really doesn't want the money he doesn't it closes that that part of it to so you know as a uh, as an audience, that there are no ulterior ulterior motives that Charlie has because he is willing to do what's best for him from his view. Yeah, and the fact that he won three hundred thousand dollars at Vegas to solve that kind of problem. Here, here's a check for two hundred thousand. If you just walk away, F that I got three hundred thousand dollars. Did he already. get three hundred? I thought he only got like eighty six. No, we got three hundred thousand. I don't know. He got a lot of money. I, don't know. I said eighty six as he was doing the math. No, no, no. He was eighty six is what he needed. Right. He needs eighty six to cover his expenses. So he, yeah. So well, three hundred thousand dollars. So he had he, he had solved money. money yeah, problems. no, he had fuck you money at that and, point. And it's weird. In the summary, Greg says that he, you know, he saved his business and everything like that. I didn't get the impression he saved his business. I think he, I got the impression that it just because they had already taken the cars and it, or, you know, no, but it. his his business was there because he never lost that money. Yeah, he was able to pay so, back the yeah. eighty grand. Okay, right. So he was able to pay back the the people who bought the cars. But right. And right. by the way, now a nineteen eighty eight Lamborghini Countach is probably worth about twelve dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so. Those rich guys got hoes. Right. It's it's no Lotus, right? But I do in watching this back again. I did uh, in the story and showing that that art, the Charlie Babbitt arc. I thought they did a really good job of developing. Whereas a lot of films kind of cheat and 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 do shortcuts and having one scene that ultimately they you know oh now everything's all good and this is where he's made, had his epiphany. You don't really get that here. You kind of have a slow build. And a gradual development. I thought they did a really good job of that. These these two brothers. Yeah, I was really surprised that Cruz wasn't nominated for something because I thought he did a, a really good job of showing frustration with dealing with Raymond in the beginning of the film, where he has to get out of the car at one point and just start yelling. Other points, he wants to taunt Raymond when he's trying to uh, get him inside the house to watch the people's court line and saying he's the Nielsen people. When that lie fails, he tells Raymond, "Well, you blew it because you're you." You know, and you can just see that frustration of, of somebody who who wants to do the right thing is just fed up with somebody who's so entrenched that they uh, they can't break out of their habits. Well, this is my favorite uh, Tom Cruise performance. I think it's his best performance um, of the films that I've seen of his for that very reason. Because I mean, have you seen Legend? <laughs> Okay, set legend aside. Yeah, okay. Forest boy. Okay, you obviously have not seen losing it. <laughs> he plays a forest boy like no other. <laughs> right. <laughs> a fairy. <laughs> There's always like those gay undertones to his movies, right? I mean, there you get the little fairy in Top Gun. I mean, that was just a bad house. It wasn't even understated, yeah. Here in Rain Man, he's like, let's go to Palm Springs for the weekend. You're like, all right, Tom, we know why you're going to Palm Springs. <laughs> get out of this L.A. Right. You don't even have to mention cocktail. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he came up with a different definition for red eye in that movie. Oh, cocktail's so bad, dude. <laughs> oh, such a shitty movie. Yeah. But in this film, he's at least he plays those 
you said the frustration, the understanding, and when he starts actually appreciating his brother, all those things are understated, and he does a, a really good job of of not overacting, basically, in this movie. And that's what I think yeah, he does he, in Born very, on the Fourth of July. He's very genuine, and he usually is in, in his roles, even if he's not doesn't have a great amount of range. He's but he's extremely genuine here and very believable. And, and what I really like, and he did have actually, I don't, I mean, looking this up, he did research his role. He went out and interacted with retarded people and you can see that in in top gun when he's talking to kelly mcgillis <laughs> <laughs> what, what, i want you to know when i fly my plane and my crew come first <laughs> that's my tom cruise impression i don't think it's, <laughs> i think it's pretty good <laughs> what i really enjoyed was how and it's obviously clever script writing and clever directing and, and two actors pulling it off is the who's on first routine and how that is sort of uh, uh, Raymond's uh, a security blanket, his what his coping mechanism. He'll resort to running the entire routine whenever something you know jars him, something that is out of the, you know the routine. And the dialogue during the road trip between Charlie and Ra- and Raymond really is a lot like that routine. It's two people having a conversation, but they're on entirely different. They're not understanding one another. And I think that's that's a really well done script director and, and actors in, in that. I think that's very clever, very well thought out. Well, not I, cheesy at all, just very well done. Well, and I think one of the things that helped build this kind of rapport, this relationship between the two actors is Barry Levinson's choice to pretty much film it in sequential order as they make the trip. You could... So it, it probably made it a lot easier for the two actors to have that kind of touchstone. I'm not filming this scene that happens at the beginning. I'm filming the scene that happens at the end. That they they got to know each other as they go along, even as actors together, and then and kind of develop this relationship. So you could see this gradual change rather than these abrupt cuts where we're here, we're here, we're here. It you you see you you kind of see the building of a relationship between the two. Well, and apparently the actors did spend a ton of time together rehearsing, going through things uh, when they were off. So that kind of it makes sense if they were filming it sequentially, how that really did develop amongst the actors. And they, they do develop a chemistry. And I, I think you see it in the film and it comes off pretty well in the film. They probably couldn't do that today anymore because that, as Patrick said, that's rarely done where, where directors are permitted to film in sequence just because of all the costs and and logistical problems. And then the other thing is that it's it's pretty clear. I, I mean, they're. They're definitely crossing the Ohio River. You can see the sign where they're coming from Kentucky back to Ohio towards Cincinnati, and that's after uh, uh, Charlie kidnaps Raymond. So it's the, it's the ride to the hotel. That hotel uh, was a, a real hotel in Cincinnati, in uptown Cincinnati that they stayed at. So he really was filming in Cincinnati and in, in sub- suburban Cincinnati on the Kentucky right. side. I, I presume that the the institution was some sort of building in that same area that they used. So I'm not sure about that. But but, but and and obviously there's scenes in Los Angeles. So it, it's nice that in Vegas. They, yeah, that was in that was in Caesar's, Caesar's Palace. And and so again today it would be filmed in Toronto and right and Tucson. Well, well uh, let's talk about the the Vegas scene because I think that's that's the one that really comes to mind when you think about this this film with them coming down the elevators and kind of the matching suits. Right. Looking back on it, I, I just really had a big problem even when they first get to Vegas, uh, when they're going to count cards. I, I like the idea of him counting cards and him trying to use his brother to do that. And, and coming, it, he doesn't realize it until in that moment that that's a possibility. I like that part of it. Right. Um, but one of the, the things they, they build up that, that Raymond really has a problem with, with strangers Right. But you never see him do the routine when he gets to the casino. And you got to think that that is going to be something totally new to him. Before that, they show him. Unless it's just sensory overload and he just completely. Okay. Yeah. But, but if he completely shuts, shuts down and then fo- just focuses on yeah, his he one zone, path. He zones in. Who knows? That's, what, that's what I saw that in. But he I, just zones in on his path. But, but I agree with you. It is a little inconsistent. And, and, and then a little before that, he has a stranger doing his hair. Right. And you go, wait, I thought he had a problem with people touching him. And I thought the, and routine, yeah, and right. different routines, and so I thought they they got they cheated a little, a little bit, bit more there. style over yeah. substance. Yeah, that part. they do a lot of things for plot purposes. I had read how the uh, girlfriend was supposed to be kind of a blonde bombshell, and that they cast uh, Valerie Valeria or Valeria Galino or whatever. I don't think that's how you Italian pronounce her name. whore. It's yeah, Valerie. 
so like but Mallory anyways, fart because because she barely spoke English and she had this strong wait Italian she accent. barely spoke English <laughs> but the idea was that what they could do then is use Tom Cruise to explain things because she doesn't understand I, I think she's completely uses as useless oh she's yeah. horrible she's well, useless other I, than she's allowed she allows him to you know you know expound upon whatever this is what went on between between but, my uh, father without right. showing a scene of that right but without he a narration could, but he could or still do that with someone who spoke English who was all you have to say is hey I never knew what happened with you and your father you say you hate him what happened and him go you want to know what happened here's what happened why do you have to have someone who can't speak English for him to try to explain yeah, it, it? it could have okay. been done with Dr. Bruner or the, the I didn't state do attorney. that was their intention that was why they well did it. then they're retards <laughs> yeah she's horrible well, and, and the and I'm glad that she she's a she leaves and she's gone for oh three fourths of the film at least for the the bulk of it when it becomes a road trip. But the fact that she comes back is just meh. Well, they they throw her back so she can try to bang Raymond in the elevator. Yeah, which was that's not necessary. That's kind of a dumb part. I think it showed this kind of this interaction that that they showed that when he wanted to have the date that there was a there was a little bit of loneliness to his character that he was he, you know he was attracted to women he. But he didn't know how to interact with them. I thought I, I, I thought it was a little interesting. It didn't really add much ultimately in the film, but it was it was all right. And I thought it led to a nice joke during the psychiatrist scene when he said, "Oh, I yeah, I, I know." It leads to a nice joke. I mean, the the funnier joke is her fucking moaning uh, <laughs> and <Raymond>. sex. Yeah, <laughs> m- 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 but that scene didn't make any sense either because you go, "Why are you leaving the door open?" Right. I hear an extra moan in the bedroom. I'm shooting. <laughs> so, and I don't mean my load. Now you talk about the other the other actors in it. It's Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise. Galino doesn't really do much. She's not really that good of actress in this. But the other two roles, uh, the psychi- the two other major roles, are psychiatrist played by Barry Levinson, the director, and Doctor Bruner, who I'd he, seen. Which Barry Levinson is uncredited in it. Yeah, he's uncredited. It was supposed to be uh, J T. Walsh, but he had to back out for some reason. Oh, I like moment. J T. Walsh. Yeah, I What's like, he in? Yeah, he uh, plays he's in dead it. now. But what he was, was a, he a few good men. He was the uh, colonel play, who killed himself. He plays oh, an yeah. asshole well, too. Yeah, he, he would have played that scene just play. fine, yeah. But the, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Bruner is actually, he's been in films, but he's a producer. And he co-produced this film, and he, he's the producer on Hook, oh. Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, Minority Report. He's been a producer on a lot of things, wow. and he was in this. And and so he, the, <clears> the other found two out actors. a way to give him more money. Yeah. Yeah. How so, can I get more money out of this film? I know, I'll cast myself. Well, it's interesting that the only... He does a good job, though. No, he does a good job. The only essential two really good actors in this are the two leads. Everybody else is just relatively inexperienced or, you know, just filling in to fill a small spot. Yeah. A lot of extras, basically. I love when that doctor comes to Los Angeles, too. He's talking to Tom Cruise, and he's like, yeah, I'll meet you. Uh, And Tom Cruise says to the doctor, where are you? And the doctor says, well, I'm staying at the Bonaventure. I'd be like, no, shit, you're staying at the Bond Adventure because you got three million of my brother's dollars. That's why you're staying at the Bond Adventure. You should be staying at fucking Motel Six, Super Eight, man. Yeah, some trustee, right? Yeah. So, how pissed do you think Kmart was when this came out? They were, they were very pissed, well, as K- well as every airline. Yeah, I, <laughs> Kmart does suck. But the, 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 apparently, the when this was filmed or when this was shown on uh, flights, they cut that scene where he's talking about the statistics of of uh what did they just have him freaking out in the airport <laughs> I, guess. I guess i'm sure they just jumped jumped to that i think that's funny except for Qantas. Qantas apparently uh was very happy <laughs> and still has well, not had a jet crash since then yeah just a propeller just propeller planes jets yeah, have never crashed and apparently he didn't know that either barry levinson whoever wrote it didn't know that going in it was just a jag and he just threw that out there and it happened to be correct at least that's what the imdb says and i'm sure they're oh not i wrong. don't believe that at all <laughs> Yeah, that's well, just pick an airline. Oh, it just, oh, happens, it just happens to be the one that has. What are you saying, Jason? The internet would lie to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Flying our jets, those don't crash. Propeller planes Bro, now have pirates. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else on the on the story or the film generally? Yeah, the music. Oh yeah, I did oh, write. Man. I did have that written down. The music's bad. It's like ninja ninja music. Every time they play a, a, a piece of music whether it be the beginning, the end, or through the film, it it sucks. The score blows. The score feels like I should be walking through the jungle and it, looking for ninjas. And there's no basis. I mean, like, like you said, it just doesn't yeah, Nothing or, fits. Or you're in a candle store. 
That is true. Or a candle store, yeah. It's a pan flute. Or I think Legend's yeah. going to start. Le- it is. It's, a, it's a, like they took it from Legend. It, it, it's weird you bring that up because I worked in the movie theater. I, well, I worked, started working in movie theater and this was still playing there. And I remember having to walk through this theater checking it many times. And I always, Did you find ninjas? No, I never, oh. never found a ninja. Not one. Because that music means a ninja is nearby. He's looking at you. When I started working there, it had been out for six months, so I very seldom found anybody in the theater watching it as well. But that's that's beside the point. But Patrick, every time, that there's definitely definitely no one here. Definitely. <laughs> definitely definitely don't need to clean this theater. Def, no, no. Ow, ow. Um, but no, when I would walk through it, it would just... I, I hadn't seen the film yet at this point in time, even six months after the fact, and... I always go, what is this music? It was just very, it, was, I, it would cause me to stop. Like, this just does not, this is not what I expect this from this. not this, fit this film. This right. film. I mean, I, I agree with you. It's kind of this ninja, you know, <laughs> Asian you, right. kind of film that, you know, I expect to, to be rice fields and things like that. And it, it just did not fit, fit Rain Man. That was something, one of my first, um, it, you know, memories of this film is that the music just sounds all weird. And, so. and Ico Ico at the very beginning is just... What? Oh, that's, what yeah, that's happening? not a good song. Played better in Mission Impossible 2. <laughs> <laughs> and and do you call it Ico Ico or do you call it the Jack Me Off song? It's the Jack Me Off song. Jack Me Off Free IA or something. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to jack Matt free, jack off Matt for free. Just play Ico Ico. Wow. Odd choice. It yeah. is. Well, and we talked briefly about it being nominated and winning Best and, and, Picture. Um, usually Best Score wins. When you win, when yeah. you sweep the awards, and this did, it, it, all the big ones, the Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, and Best, best screenplay. Original Screenplay. Wow. Usually the score just kind of gets thrown in there. Not in this case. No, no. It, it, it didn't get nominated, right? No, it was nominated. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Can't, what, Hans Zimmer? But it's not going to win. His first this score. is his first one. Right. They what else did he do? They don't let ninjas into the Academy Awards with swords, dude. <laughs> If a ninja can't bring his sword, and he's not going to show up. That music's not being played. Wait, so what else did Hans Zimmer do? Because this was his first score. He did Gladiator. Oh, that's good music. I mean, that's a good score. And Gladiator. A gladiator. Some of this would have been, like Jason said, this would have been a wonderful score for a ninja movie. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine doing the Oscars, and you're like, oh, shit, we got to play Rain Man. Who knows how to play the pan flute? <laughs> Anyone. Anyone. We'll just go to that Jack Me Off song. Yeah. The nerd's like, I, I still got my recorder. And they're like, ah, we'll try that. He did He did the Dark Knight and Batman Begins. He did uh, Lion King. He did Inception. Oh, wow. He did Pirates of the Caribbean. All much better yeah, scores. Yeah, they all, the scores seem to fit those films. Yeah, I really, it works. Yeah, I guess he was off his South uh, America. Maybe he wrote this. this. No, maybe he wrote this for another film, and they're like, ah, mm. do you want to yeah, score like, something? He's like, yeah, the napkin i've got this one already written. like i wrote something for amazon pygmy ninjas <laughs> I, uh, I think this will just work. throw that in there i right. was supposed to do it for last emperor but this might work for your film <laughs> well it, the, the title rain man he thought rainforest oh rain- he did right. that is it <laughs> he's I, like i really misinterpreted that I, I should really watch these films before i write the score uh we'll, we'll just, yeah f- the napkin we'll just yeah. use it uh, another thing that i that i found interesting is that they Apparently, this movie is connected somehow to Forrest Gump, that the studios were... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me try to figure out the connection. <laughs> is Tom Hanks in both? No. No, that's not Does it. Does Forrest Gump have a 49 Buick Roadmaster Fireball 8? Somewhere. Uh, Maybe one of those flashbacks. Oh, well, that must be it then. I don't know. I guess that's it. But that the studios, they were worried about... Apparently, they were being pitched around the same time. Well, they both were at Warner Brothers at the same time, is what the, the story was. Or was going to be... No, they were they were they were pitching it for to go into production at Warner Brothers. Yeah, and the, the guys behind Rain Man knew that they had Forrest Gump, right? And said they and they'd heard that Forrest Gump they were going to greenlight Forrest Gump. So they undersold this. So they undersold this so that they would let it go because if they bought it, they were afraid that they would just bury it. They would bury it so it would not compete with Forrest Gump. Right. So Forrest Gump was going to be made in 1988 or yes. come out. It was it was 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 getting ready to go into production. Wow. Right. Who who was going to play Forrest Gump then? I, it wasn't it, Tom Hanks. It didn't say no because it doesn't come out till ninety four. Right, right? Yeah, ninety five. So Tom Hanks needs to get AIDS before he becomes good. That's yeah. right. So, but what they ended up doing is once it got cut loose by Warner Brothers, went to MGM, started production there. Um, of course, the screenplay changed because it originally was supposed to be mentally retarded, not autistic. So there is a bit, there is some similarity between ultimately Forrest Gump and the original screenplay. And then they're not both full-on retards, right? And, and then it goes out and becomes a big hit. And Warner Brothers, it's Tropic Thunder, man, it's not, it's not me. 
quoting Tropic Thunder. Right. Well, and, and don't start quoting Pulp Fiction or any other <laughs> Quentin Tarantino movie. <laughs> so ultimately, after Rain Man comes out, Warner Brothers says, well, we can't make this film now because it's too similar to Rain Man. So they let Forrest Gump go and it gets eventually gets made. Forrest Gump and Rain Man. That's yeah, I think very similar. Definitely. Definitely similar. They're not similar at all. Yeah, I don't see being it. Sarcastic. Yeah, I don't see it similar. No. I was gonna say, okay, I don't, I don't what? see it similar at all. That's why I don't. Studio execs don't necessarily read full scripts. They <laughs> usually, what's this about? Well, this guy's retarded. Oh, we already got one of those. Yeah, we already we got, got a okay. retard movie. And Rain Man came out last year. My left foot this year. What the hell are you talking Wait. about? <laughs> yeah, but they both won the Oscar. He's a shoe in. Well, I got these two scripts for uh, meteors hitting the Earth. That's gold. Let's go with both of those. <laughs> no, one's a meteor. One's a comic. How, how about this different. one? I got this one for, uh, it's about Wyatt Earp, and this one's about Tombstone. Well, who, who's in Tombstone? <laughs> Wyatt Earp. Oh, well, let's go both. Of, with no, those. no, no. This one's like three hours long and not interesting. <laughs> All right. Anything else on this uh, Oscar winner? And this was our Oscar episode. This is our Oscar episode. The only one, so get over it, people. Yeah. yeah. We, we've learned from there's, Halloween and Christmas, we don't like to do multiple episodes for things. No, the look, Oscars overrated. Overrated, yeah. All right, so let's go around and see what we think about Rain Man. Jason. Yes. Yes, what? Test time. I like it. Still like it? Sure. Liked it then? Uh, yeah, I liked it then. I still like it now. I thought the performances are great. Greg. I liked it then. I like it now. Great film. Uh Great performances by Dustin Hoffman and and a great rapport with him and Tom Cruise. I think, yeah, it's a great movie. Yeah, Patrick, I, I liked it back when I finally did see it in like eighty nine. So well after it, uh, I probably like it more now. I think it's a much more interesting film. I'm more attentive to the details of the acting nuances and the relationship. And I, I really appreciate kind of the understated approach to this film. It's very it's very simplistic, very kind of bare bones, and it's just a story about two people. Wow, four for four. I uh, loved it back then. I love it now. Probably like it now more. It's two hours and 13 minutes, and it doesn't feel like that at all. So it's it's uh, still really entertaining and, and well acted. So ah, let's give, give it up for Rain Man and the Academy Awards, the one time they get it right. If you'd like to support our podcast, go to our webpage, and you can get to Amazon through our webpage. And if you do that and buy anything on Amazon, that does support the podcast. So please do that. Also, uh, check us out on Facebook at Lunchtime Movie Review and follow us on Twitter at Lunchtime Movie. Keep listening. We're getting out of here right now and you guys are invited. Definitely, definitely, definitely getting out of here. Invited. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Lunchtime Movie Review, Fireworks, is provided courtesy of Alexander Nakaranda at SerpentSoundStudios.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network, Lunchtime Movie Review, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.